Welcome to God's Business, where I interview the, the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and business owners on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business where he is the multiplier of your success. I have the honor of having the first in-person interview with a great friend of mine. He's actually a partner inside of our company, the King's Brotherhood. He's built his own business with his wife, Kaylin, to over $200 million in revenue at 700,000 customers. Inc. number four, fastest growing B2C company in North America and exited by 29 years old. Welcome my good friend, Mr. Brandon Poole. Yeah, man, let's go. I'm excited to be here, bro. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. Like, two hundred million dollars in revenue, seven hundred thousand customers, all these accolades and really cool things. I was hoping that you'd wear your brand new watch. You just posted six figure watch. Like, <laughs> yeah, man, I, I had to get the links done. I didn't have time. Yeah, I guess I, an, just I, I guess it. another iced out diamond watch just will have to fit for now. Yeah, the Hublot will do. But what's interesting, even about watch, just because people will be like, oh, fancy watch, fancy watch. Talk about why you even started looking at watches in the first place as a investor now, even after exiting Lady Boss. Man, I, I've always liked watches, but um, I never bought one. I was like, I, I'm actually really conservative. Like even like the family office that I work with, they're like, you're really conservative, especially because you're young. And so I would never buy myself one. I, was, I always wanted one, like I wanted a Breitling. That was the watch. Because I like the big watches, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then my wife bought it for me. And so when she bought it for me, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you spent this much money on a freaking thing I'm going to wear on my arm. You know, like that's ridiculous. You know what I mean? And like this you is like, like the Honda big... Civic. It's like you bought a Honda Civic on, the, on my wrist. And, and the big one was just because you're like, if I'm going to buy one, it's got to be like Yeah, it's a, it was a, it's a Breitling <laughs> Super Avenger 2 with a diamond bezel on it, all factory. It's an amazing watch. I love that watch. It's like shiny band. Like it's a boss watch. But... Uh, I, I would have never bought it for myself. And it actually wasn't until I realized that watches actually hold their value. Men's watches do. So don't buy women's watches. But men's watches, they hold their value actually really well. And so once I started looking at it like an asset class, it's really an alternative asset class. Um, but like any asset, if you buy it overpriced, it's not going to do you well in the long term, right? So, so I look at it like an asset. So this one I actually got in Italy. Um, on a trip there and they were having such a hard time moving inventory obviously because of covid and italy was hit so hard and so it was in venice and so they were basically giving like that tax refunds that were massive and then they were also doing um like a store credit so i like got a free breitling when i bought this watch so i actually bought into it with equity of its market value right and, and so it's like a trophy it's like a cool story it's a trophy it looks awesome like it's funny because you like you build wealth and it just sits in like an account or an asset somewhere and you never get to see it or enjoy it. And so with a watch, like it's kind of different because it's, it's not like this stupid liability that's losing value over time. Some of them can actually appreciate like two of my Rolexes are like worth double what I bought them for. Wow. Right. And, um, and it's not like a great, it's an alternative asset class. It's not something that I would be like, oh yeah, take your first money and like buy expensive watches. Like I would never tell someone to do that, but it's fun. Could you imagine though, like, doing something fun that actually makes money, which is different. Like you had talked about, like most of the things you do that are fun don't make anyone money. True. It also shows the difference between what we see and what's behind the scenes, which even with God's business, like my goal is to rip over, open the layers of someone who's built a big business and that would be this conversation. Some people maybe have, are spiritual giants and they maybe haven't built the business, but you've built the business and peeling back that layer of like, how did God influence that journey? And even with the asset class, like people look at the watch and the kids are like, oh, I want a sick watch. Or they look at the cars in the garage. These guys have like 12 cars in the garage and they go, I can't believe these guys have 12 car payments. Not knowing that a yeah. lot of these cars are actually investments for Ho these guys. Hopefully. And, yeah. I, you look <laughs> or at, unless they really like it and you have the money, right? Or it's that percentage of income. So <laughs> That's right. So obviously for you, if you got the watches, $200 million business, it'd be common to have like, you obviously had a loan from your family who started you out correctly and you know they probably you know you probably bought it with your like trust fund kid right your yeah. like trust fund membership yeah and and yeah uh, the and, spoon the big spoon that i was born with i mean what's what's the common <laughs> what's the commonality that we see with people that are young yeah that i mean even me sometimes i'll see if i see a young guy sometimes i'm like 
huh, I wonder, like, did he actually go through the, yeah, what's daddy the do? really tough things or yeah, what's daddy do? Yeah. No, I didn't have that at all. I mean, I didn't grow up like, I didn't struggle when I grew up. Yeah. But my dad was always hustling. Like I learned how to hustle from him. I learned, I knew I was going to be an entrepreneur because of my dad. Like I remember walking in the house and he was like sitting in his chair, like listening to his tapes for like his new sales. There's actually a manufactured home place across the street. And that's one of the things that he did in his career was he sold manufactured homes. And so he was always hustling, but uh, I didn't, I didn't want for anything, yeah. but I was never given anything. Like I never, like my parents didn't give me a car. You know what I mean? Like the, I, it was like, it was like what I had like an allowance and I got a Pokemon card pack. Like that was, the, that was what I was given when I was a kid. Right. It was like every single week it was like and that your age been... per week in dollars. That's what, that was my silver spoon. Dang. And what's crazy is those that you were investing in Pokemon back in the day before it was like when it was cool, but then yeah. did you keep them? Dude, I like did. And then like, I don't know what happened to them. You know what I mean? I sold mine at a garage sale. Did you really? Yeah, for like 30 bucks for the whole thing. I had like, like the whole thing. Oh, uh, dude, I had the. And some guy that was watching Gary Vee just bought them all and this sold them all on eBay for like $2,000. Gary Vee was probably like still selling wine for his dad. This was like <laughs> 2010, 2011. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I blew it out. But I think the interesting thing about what you're talking about is multiple things. One is like God puts desires in our hearts before you're even a Christian, right? Because like you're cut from the cloth. You're you're made in his image. And this is why I don't like when people like beat themselves up. Like we're nobody. We're no good. We're just wretched, terrible people. On the sin side, yeah, but like originally we were created in the image as an art form. It's like looking at God's art or someone's art and being like, man, you're amazing, but that art piece is freaking garbage. Like I don't like that. But even with David or we look at like, King Solomon or or Saul to, to David, like there was this thing where God had a destiny in someone. So like this entrepreneur side of you was already placed in you before you were ever a Christian. But how did you get out of the frame of the world? I even see Christians do this. I look at Christians in the world and a lot of them, even if they believe in God and they should have this vision, you look at the disciples, they're going after it. They're supposed to go to the, all the ends of the earth. And at that point, like no one had really gone to the ends of the earth, right? It's like people thought the world was flat until like not that long ago. And so there's this like ambition. Oh, they this still excitement. think the world's this, flat. Oh yeah, I forgot. Or I mean, like yeah, actually I forgot. They, they actually do. There are yeah. a lot of people that do. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think yeah, we don't want to go down that rabbit trail. It's not, by yes. the way. Just in case anyone's wondering how I'd sit on this this side of the subject. Yes, I also it's don't think the world is not flat. So I, I look at that though. From your side, you're in this. Not you're not around people that have exited a two hundred million dollar revenue company. Like growing up, that's not who you're around all day. That's not who I was around all day. No. So it's natural to just adapt to the environment that you're in. But as a Christian as well, Christians who should have these big visions adapt to the world's view rather than God's view. How did you go out there and build a $200 million company even though you were never around it? You would think you'd have to be around those types of people to do it. How did you shift your frame and dream bigger than your environment? I mean, I think in the beginning I wasn't, but then I started to be around those types of people, right? Like, mm -hmm. so in the beginning it was just friends and family, right? And my dad had always been, you know, made a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, like provided a great life, hustle sold. My mom was in education. She was a principal, <laughs> right? Yeah. So she did, she did great. She did fine, yeah. right? Like I, I didn't, I didn't want for anything as a kid. Like I, I was fine, but so I didn't initially start around those types of people, but then I got around them. And I think that's really, and so, so that the inception of that was, first it was network marketing. So this is actually where we met, right? Yeah. So I signed up for this company, Buy to Buy Buy, in the 90 Day Challenge, right? And MLM is such a great vehicle if you're just like trying to learn leadership, selling, like you wanna learn the ropes of like what it takes to market and sell and create revenue without having to deal with any of the operational um, fulfillment, anything else, right? Like they literally give you a business in a box that you just have to go sell. Yep. Right. And, uh, and so I think it's such a great vehicle. And so that was the first time I was around. And I remember there was an event in Austin, right where we are right now. And it was like the regional event for the company. And my dad was like, no, he's not serious. We're not taking him to the event. Cause I had signed up under my parents. I was under them. Like they owned a gym and were promoting this health challenge. Right. It made sense. And, and they were like, no, he's not ready. He doesn't take it serious, you know, cause I was like a heathen. I was like 17, mm -hmm. like I legally signed up like at 17. Like I think you have to be 18 to sign up for a distributorship yep. in one of these. And, and so, but my stepmom actually was like, Stephanie, she was like, no, he's going to go. 
Like we got to give them a chance. And, and so that getting at that event, there was like a thousand people there. There was like the speakers and I just never like, these people just thought bigger and it was in the confines of MLM. Right. So it wasn't like, like, you know, entrepreneur, it's not like, it's like half entrepreneurship. Yeah. Like MLM is like entrepreneurship 0.5. <laughs> like it's, I'm, it's I'm halfway sure there. That, that won't go over well, but yeah, yeah. that sounds good. <laughs> well, I think you own your own business to a point, but you don't really. Yeah. Cause you have no control. So, yeah. so you could argue it's you own your own business. It's like you have your own means to create, um, to create income that's greater than jobs and you have control over that, mm-hmm. but you don't have control over anything else the business does. Right. Yep. So, so anyway, th- being around those people and then it turned into masterminds and mentors and like, and then it just became like peer groups and relationships. And so I think I started not around it knowing I was going to be, I was different. Like I remember sitting in the back of my mom's um, Lexus and we were going through a McDonald's drive through and I, I had to have been like five years old or something. And I remember thinking like, okay, so she's like giving money, right? Like she'd hand the dollars out the window and we're like buying food, but like they're going to keep the money. We're going to keep the food, but like they had to get the food. The food wasn't like free. So there had to be like a cost. So they didn't keep all the money. Like my brain was thinking about margins like as a kid, yeah. not because like I like the money, it was just like it fascinated me, like the economics of it. So I knew I was different in that way. Do you actually remember what you wanted to be when you grow up? People make these posts. What did you want to be? For me, it was pro motocross racer. So I didn't care. My dad was a business owner as well. So I was kind of, I was embarrassed when my dad would pick me up in a work vehicle. Now I'd be like, that's so cool. Like yeah. my dad did his own thing. But for yeah. me, I was like, bro, all these guys are getting picked up in regular cars. Yeah. I'm getting picked up in the carpet cleaning van. Like that's not cool, <laughs> but it's cool now. Yeah. Your dad as well. What, but Dude, you kill it on a motocross track, by the way. Thanks, man. We need to go. We're like halfway there right now. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we drove out here to the studio. So um, me and Nicholas go way back, guys. We go way back. Like what? Good friends since 2016, January. We knew oh, January. I, See, he remembers the month. I like that. I think it's because that's- You are detail-oriented. F- FHL event, yeah. Okay. It was the, the Funnel Hacking Live event. Yeah. Um, was that the one that we spoke at or was that the You're year also before? wearing a, I think a it was the year blue before. V-neck t-shirt and you sat down to the left of me behind your wife who was in between All us. All right, chill out now. A... Chill out. All right, chill out. Yeah. <laughs> and you were talking to someone else not listening to me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that that was that was kind of you, you know when you like you know when you like meet people and you just there's some sort of magnetism there. Yeah. And totally God was like orchestrating our friendship. Yeah, our let's just go into that cuz that's like yeah, like the you had talked about the magnetism, but ultimately that was what kind of solidified it, our relationship. Because there's lots of great business owners and couples and cool people at the event. But yeah, yeah. I don't know. I I mean, my wife is like that. She's so in tune with the supernatural. It's crazy. Um, like she's been mirac- miraculously healed, as you know, um, like her hands, and that's a crazy story. And and so she's been miraculously healed. She gets like dreams. She gets visions for people and she gets words of knowledge for people. And like, so we'll be at, you know, a, a Christian entrepreneur event or church and she'll get like a vision for somebody and she'll run over and like tell them. And then like the woman just starts weeping. It's always women too. It's like, yeah. um, but, but anyway, so she, she, she like anyone who like hangs out with us knows like my wife is like the social butterfly and I'm kind of like, I'm halfway in between, but she'll just, she'll just like gravitate towards certain people or relationships and she just pours so much into them. And so I'm grateful for that because I'm like, I have to like intentionally do that. It's like natural for her. So she saw you guys and it was just like, it was just like this natural gravitation kind of thing. And then, and then uh, we ended up moving to the same city, right? Not for each other or any reason that was aligned, like, but just kind of randomly almost. Yeah. And even when I look at that conversation with Kaylin, it was weird because you're in the middle of a business event. I think she was about to go up to the room and we just sat down and she listened to Amanda and I's story for probably like, I couldn't imagine being in your shoes, not knowing like, what, what are they talking about? Yeah. It was hours. Like yeah. it had to have been like solid three, maybe more hours. Of yeah. I'm like, like trying to escape up the elevator and then she gets, sits down and I'm like, ah, oh, here we go. And you she's know. just drilling us with questions about, about supernatural, about what God had done in Amanda and I's relationship. 
I, I want to get to the miracle story because I feel like it's so cool, but I feel like I'll never go backwards. For you, you you grew up in this home. It's You said stepmom, so obviously your parents broke up. How yeah, old were when you? I was two. So you don't even remember. You have no memory. I remember sitting in the lawyer's office that was supposed to like talk no. to the two of us. Yeah, there was like a guardian at litem is what they call it. And so it's like, this is like the lawyer that like is supposedly decides, basically talks to the kids and figures out what the kids want. And you, you were know. two, and when they were like, they, they, they did that whole three, thing where four. they put the parents on each side of the room and like, no, which one no, do they run no. to? <laughs> <laughs> no, our parents weren't in there. It was just like me and my brother. Uh, and he was, he's two and a half years older than me. Yeah. So really I was just like, I don't know, whatever he says, because I had no freaking clue. Wow. Was that weird? Um, yeah, it was really strange. I mean, I was a kid. I didn't know any different. I just remember feeling like, like this is uncomfortable. Like... I love my, both my parents. I have no idea what's going on. Yeah. You know, conceptually as a kid, you're like, I'm like three, four years old. Like, I don't, I don't know what's actually happening. Right. And they're both like, you know, they weren't, it, it wasn't ugly. It, I, I don't think it was ugly. I mean, yeah. I think they, they were cordial about it, you know, the way it, it, it went down. And, um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, I mean, I, I had two birthdays, two Christmases, yeah. switched back and forth, did the week. But one thing I do, I, I always respect massively is that my dad, um, my dad fought, fought for time. And he actually moved from California where he had his business. Yeah. So he had like 100 door knockers selling auto, auto, discounted auto coupon cards. So he had a massive sales, uh, a massive sales organization of guys door knocking. And he left California, came back to Albuquerque, um, where I was at the time and where my mom was, because he wanted to pursue his kids through a divorce, after a divorce. Which, like, a lot of men, really easy to, like, just, you know, she calls for the divorce, you're over here in another state, you have your business, you got two kids. It's, it's really easy to just kind of, like, go with the flow. Okay, get your weekends. Yeah. But, like, he fought for us, which yeah. I always, like respect did, so did you much. notice that at the time or did it take no later? no at the time at the time i um at the time i didn't notice it or understand it at, at the time it's probably felt uh control like if i were to think about my dad i'm like my dad did the same thing but he never really expressed it like i just love you and want to be around you it was kind of like i thought he was trying to control me or he's upset or like any of those things yeah like, hmm. so so looking back now like for for your dad what what did you think at the time? Why did he move out there? And what what was your thought around it? I I just I just remember once I came of age and like understood like once I was a teenager. Mm. I, honestly, it was probably wasn't until we kind of started working together in the MLM, right? Yeah. Like we worked around each other, we worked together in that um, that I really appreciated. Like when I became an adult, you know what I mean? Yeah. I appreciated the fact that he left all of that to pursue getting half custody with us in a state that was very difficult, very, most states favor the moms, which is fine and it's great. And, and dads have a bad track record. If you look at statistics, they have a bad track record, Yeah. right? They're, they're absent more often than not. So, um, so the fact that he did that, it was an example for me that I won't forget, you yeah. know, like I don't forget that at all because, um, and just the way he is with my kids now, like I have two little girls and you know, it's, it's, it's been a blueprint for me you know, and just how to like interact with them and like, you know, how do you like interact with your kids and like just seeing that and he goes all out with them is amazing. What about stepmom relationship? When did that come into play? Uh, not too long after they split. It was a couple of years, I think. So you remember it like you were like five, six. Yep. How was that dynamic? Because I know there's other people uh, out there that have gone through this, meaning you have a new mom, like, yeah, I, I had my stepmom Step moved monster. in two, <laughs> two weeks after my mom left. Two weeks? Was living in my dad's house. Wow. No, it wasn't like that. And, and I was, was like I was years. Four. So I was like four years old. So it was, it was we were around the same age. So it was like, hey, like you can call her mom if you want. Yeah. And I was like, I need to leave. Yeah. Like I'm like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And, I, and my memories are from four. So I'm like, I, you know, I didn't, they were probably well-intentioned as well. But it's just, I always say that whatever you... Your perception is reality, especially as a kid. So your parents will never remember any of this. If you were to, if we were to sit your dad and your mom down and be like, hey, remember this? I guarantee you they're going to think other things probably would be in your memory that you don't even remember. And so 
oftentimes like if you're a kid your perception of what's going on is what creates your emotion yeah and so that emotion is real even if you're completely wrong because you're so tiny so even just prefacing it like yeah what you feel doesn't mean that your parents did anything wrong it's just what you experience yeah so your stepmom moves in what was that like having a stepmom dad mom and did your mom do you have a stepdad at any point uh that? yeah she had remarried a few times that didn't work out yeah so along the way um but no the blended family thing's tough man it's hard it's just hard it's like step monster and you changed this and oh everything before you came here we had root beer floats and all these great <laughs> memories right and then now you're the dental hygienist and we can't have any sugar anymore you know yeah it's so like that was the thing and then you know you, you just blame stuff on it because you can and you're a kid yeah and it's like you just find the next thing to blame and that's an easy thing to blame so i think she i think she tried and, and the reason i talk about it is because you're going your daughter's going into the age four of when you would be going through this. And so just you looking at your home dynamic and going, okay, you and Kaylin in this solid godly relationship. Oh yeah. And and obviously we're born in a different era. Yeah. Like I have this show, God's Business, where literally, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people can grab hold of this and transform their life. At the time, your dad had a cassette tape from Tony Robbins, right? That he's putting in his headphones. Like yeah. that's all there was. Yeah. So there's more access to, to improving yourself and, and momentum that way. Yeah. But how weird is that for you knowing that your daughter, if you were to put yourself in the shoes of your daughter, four years old, and then you have another daughter that's about to turn two, right? Like right around two years old. Yep. And and so for the four-year-old, that's right around the dynamic Bro, I, where you're going into this. I couldn't imagine divorcing my wife and br breaking up my family and the devastation that would be. Like it literally just, I've never even thought about it until you just said that. Like I, like my, my brain, like God's design for the nuclear family is literally everything. It's the center of everything. It's, it's, if you look at every statistic on being a, a healthy, like um, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, like every statistic on health or the opposite of that, you you see that that statistic reigns in the nuclear family for the kids, for the parents, for for everything. Like like when we deviate from man, woman, mother, father, children, marriage union, no sex outside of marriage, like and you deviate from that, like the family breaks down, everything else breaks down. Every stat, look at it, look it up. Suicide, look it up. Depression, look it up. Medication, look it up. Fatherless homes, look it up like success of children, incomes, education, every single Drugs, one. Drugs, jail. When you deviate from that design, it's perfect. It's not, it's not walls of, of prison, it's protection. Yeah. And that's like what people don't understand. It's like, and, and you know, and like when I was growing up, it was like, it was like, you know, everyone's chasing girls, everyone's chasing whatever. And then, yeah. and then for me, like I came, I came to believe in God as like, I grew up and like, kind of like, oh, there's, there's probably God, you know, but didn't follow, didn't really know Jesus was. Yeah. Right. And I, I came to God because I had all the things the world said you should have. Mm -hmm. And it was completely empty. Like, that's my, like, my salvation story is, is having all this. And that's when you like, start, I, that's when I started to realize, and I was actually reading Proverbs this morning, right? And Proverbs is like, if, if you're an entrepreneur, it's so juicy, it's so good. It's like, just just nuggets of like, like your mind is, is blown. Like I, I was just reading you one before we got on yeah. here. Um, and, and so I'm so big on, man, like when you just said the age our, my kids are right now was like what my parents split, mm -hmm. like my brain was literally like, holy crap, like I couldn't even imagine that devastation. Like just the pain that that would cause and my heart breaks. Yeah. My heart breaks for, for broken families. And I made this post on Facebook and it is so controversial. I said, if you don't believe in the Bible, you shouldn't get married. And it was like, oh, it erupted and people were so angry. And we were together when we made the post. Yeah. Cause I was like talking about, I was like, you can say things in a way that will get people to say the same thing, but yeah. no one will care. Like marriage is a good thing for your family. Yeah. Or, or if you, Biblical marriage is, is 
that'd still be kind of crazy. The best right? design like, or whatever. Yeah, but like you said it in a way that would yeah. just drum it I, up. And I, like, basically, I basically said it was like... Smoke it was out like, the ants. I literally threw dynamite in yeah. like to smoke. Yeah, it was, it was like, if you don't believe in the Bible, you shouldn't get married. And people like freaked out. And the reason why is because it fails without God's foundation. Because yeah. it's, an, it's a biblical construct, right? And like all the arguments, and I won't get into all that that people had, it was like there was nothing that was valid. It was yeah. like some good points and thoughts, but like ultimately we're going to fail at marriage if we don't understand the construct of the covenant of marriage and the mutual submission and if we're not equally yoked. And so I just, I just wonder why do people get married? Because if, if I'm me and I'm like, okay, I'm going to like choose to be with someone the rest of my life and follow this construct. Why am I doing it? Is it because everybody else is doing it? Yeah. That's maybe why. Um, and so, and so like when you study the construct and you understand it's a biblical construct and you understand the, the, the meaning of it and how it's supposed to operate and how the woman operates, and how the man operates from a biblical standpoint, like you can have success and fruit in your marriage. But if you don't have those operating rules, it's extremely difficult to make it work. And by the way, I, I will say like Christians have just as bad as a divorce rate yeah. as, as people who are secular. And so the argument is just like most Christians don't follow the Bible and don't know it. Yeah. So, so it, it, it stirred the pot for sure. But, but man, when you think about, um, I think about all the devastation in families, it's like that nuclear family, the, the enemy is trying to destroy the nuclear family and, and he's succeeding, right? And destroying it through divorce, through pornography, through fornication, through the gender movements through like changing yourself and not, not being who God made you in his image, right? All of that impacts the nuclear family, all of it. And now, now like I literally met someone and they're like, yeah, like where we were in Seattle, we were shamed for wanting to have kids because we're going to, we're going to take up resources in the environment. And I'm just like, like, and, and uh, there's, there's stuff out there. You watch, um, you know, everybody loves to talk about Elon Musk. He's a really brilliant guy. Yeah. And one thing that um, if you look at, he talks about his population collapse. And so we're all like, we're being sold this idea of population like overload, right? Like there's not enough and there's too many people. No, it's a collapse because we're not repopulating at the same rate. And so we have all this older generation that's going to be old and need to be taken care of. And the younger generation behind is not having children. And so yeah. there's going to be this imbalance where we've got way more older people than young people and the actual population rate is not increasing at the rate that it was before. And think about and all the jobs crazy. that all these kids that have yeah. never even picked up a, a it, weight in their life or they, have you ever seen the Jordan Peterson does this thing of that men are necessary, not even just like a good thing. He's like, it's necessary. And it shows these guys like in a storm putting together the power lines and like in the sewers, like digging things out. And it's like these gnarly jobs that I'm like, I hope that there's people that are doing this and like figuring this out. Cause if not, like yeah. what, what is going to happen? And, and I think there's even some countries, like if you look at China at one point had like the one kid law where you can only have one kid. Yeah. Uh, Japan right now there's, there's like a uh, really low birth rate. So like the population of old people, like you said, at one point is going to, really collapse and it's just wild to think of. Now they're incentivizing like, and it'll probably hit here at some point, but it's like they're incentivizing people to have kids. It's like, you need to have kids. Like, yeah. This is not good. Like be fruitful and multiply. It's like, we just go back to these principles. It's like, oh, there's 2000 years ago it was written. It was like, but they're so true and they're prevalent yeah. today. And so. How'd you come to believe it though? Cause at some point, yeah. if I were to talk to you and you're 17 years old, cause I think it was right around 17, 18 that you had your first encounter with God. As you and I, we both, you grew up more in church than I did. I think I went to like a Sunday school once and I used to just skateboard outside the church. So I go with my friend <laughs> and we'd skateboard yeah. and like not go to the class cause it was dumb. Yeah. I didn't understand it. So you went a little bit more than me, but there's always this time where God is your church, your culture. And I think those are good things, right? Like you, you raise the kids up with, it's better than like ripping acid in front of your kids. If you're taking your kids to church and they don't know God yet themselves, I would think so. it's going to be better. Usually. Well, and everyone who's ripping acid and like doing all of these psychedelics, they're just yeah. looking for something. And they're I would trying agree, to right? Fill you know my story, right? Like yeah. I was 
demonic kid. Like I was searching demonic. Because you wanted you wanted supernatural power. Yeah, and I wanted to see yeah. what was bigger. Where where was yeah. something bigger than myself? And yeah. I didn't know where to find it. You you somehow yeah, and stuff started it. moving around and flying off the walls, and it was like, well, yeah. this is cool. And then you figured out where the real power was on the other side. And you look at Moses, Moses when he like. But, but the point that I was trying to make though is yeah. there's all of this talk and all of this communication about, like, what's your what degree of of familiarity do you have with psychedelics for performance? And and I'm like, guys, like, if if you watch the movie Jesus Revolution, Re, Revolution, right? The new one that yeah, just yeah. came out, so good. It's literally. I just saw like, it in theaters. Too. I've been. Uh, these are like the conversations I have with my wife that I'm just like, I can't believe like people are so stupid. Like they just, they don't know what they don't know, you know. And you're like, man, but someone's got to tell them. And yeah. it's like, your there is a a, a hole in your freaking soul shaped like the God that made you, and yeah. it's the only thing that will fill it. But we're like. We, we achieve things, and so it's interesting, it's in the entrepreneur community, it's like we achieve things that the world says you need, right? You fame, some money, you got some nice stuff, right? People want to know your name, right? The pride of life, right? We, you know, we got things with lust of the eyes, we got things that we want with our eyes, we got yep. this pride of our success in life, and then we're, we're still empty. And so now we're going, oh, well now I need to go fly and do a... Sh- over to India and get with a shaman and do an ayahuasca ceremony because I still have a hole, right? Yep. And so it just breaks my heart because people are, are, are doing these satanic rituals because that's what they are and, and they're completely obliterating and manipulating the chemicals in their brain to chase after something that only God can fill. And that's the like, and that's the crazy part, but it's like, that's not popular. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, like, no, anymore. we want... Yeah. We want to microdose LSD and lick paper and like trip our brain out and like go to these events where everyone's free and, and welcoming. But the reality is, is like it, 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 you, it will never fill that hole Yeah, because it's not the right shape. And there's a big movement of people realizing that as well. Like we've been seeing more and more stories come out of people encountering God through that. Because when I look back at Moses, you know, he pulls out his hand, he has leprosy, puts it back and it's healed. He throws down the staff, turns into a stake, he picks it up, it turns into a staff. And, and there was always people that did the same thing, right? The mimickers, right? The, the, there was the people that were doing magic at the time. And so they were well, doing all this. Because the devil can't create, he can only imitate. He can imitate, but this is what so this stuff is doing. Like imitates he, it. People are having experiences. Like, believe me, if you drink enough alcohol, you will feel something. If you take enough acid, you'll feel something. If you get LSD, if you shroom, like, you're going to feel something. Yet this is the biggest difference that I saw was that even when I was trying to encounter the supernatural, doing the ghost hunters and you know, watching all the scary movies and whatever I could do to muster up like some type of environment that would make you feel something. That's why people love the scary movies. Is that though you may experience something just as those guys who threw down their staff and it turned into another snake, just like Moses snake, uh, which by the way, then Moses ate them all up and that was how they knew, oh no, this is real. And even though those are, those are real, you never feel fulfilled. You never feel actually loved. You never feel a sense of purpose. You don't, even if someone were to come to you and tell you what you're thinking right now, and you go, you see these magicians on the street, and they do all these things, and people are like, wow, that doesn't give them any sense of purpose, no identity, no growth. It's just a magic trick. It's yeah, just an experience. It's about this deep. And, and men can get so stuck on purpose yeah. as their God, right? Chasing improvement, chasing wealth, and that can be such their God, something that they're built to have purpose and fulfillment out of purpose and they're chasing it, but kind of chasing, p- potentially, are they chasing the wrong thing? I believe for every person, they have to come to that, and you did. Walk me through your journey where you had an actual encounter with God that made you think this, because that's what it's from. Yeah. It's not like you read enough books yeah. and decided, oh, yeah, I'm set. So, so for me, it was, I maybe went to a church like five to 10 times growing up, right? Like a couple Easter's and a couple Christmases, Yeah. right? And, but I didn't, I didn't care, didn't participate, didn't buy in. I was like, this is so lame. All the girls here are all prude. <laughs> like I was absolute heathen. Like I was like a snake in the grass. <laughs> like, honestly. <laughs> I can and, see it. And so what had happened was I, I always had this like drive and this just like engine that wouldn't turn off, mm-hmm. right? Like that's just my nature. And, and so I just, I targeted and directed it towards, towards partying. And I was insane. Like, I've done a lot of drugs. I've tried a ton of stuff. 
right? But I was always the guy that researched to make sure I wouldn't kill myself, right? And I never messed with needles because I was like, I've seen those kids and they look like they're about to freaking die and I'm not doing that, Yeah, you know? So I was like... Uh, you had scruples. I, I, I had, uh, I had uh, you know, I was a regulated drug abuser. I was a smart, uh, you yeah, know, I'm sure everyone partier. feels that way as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's how I justified it. Yeah. But I'm still here. I lived. I didn't die. That's good. Yeah. I got probably got close. Um, and so then what had happened is I actually got, I, I jumped into network marketing, right? That was really it. And then business took over, right? So my desire for success and significance is where I directed that energy towards. And coming back to what I was just saying earlier about that, that hole that we have shaped like God that we can't fill. Well, I was trying to fill it. First, it was partying and just numbing myself because I didn't know what else to do, right? And then it was, um, then it was success and significance, right? The pride of life, mm -hmm. right? Making something of myself, proving that my worth, uh, material. Um, and so, in network marketing, I was making like ten grand a month. I had a BMW. I was nineteen years old. I was speaking on. A, I just remember speaking on a stage of six hundred people. People wanted to shake my hand. They wanted to know my name, and I was somebody, right? And in my little town of Albuquerque, New Mexico, you know, it was like I had arrived. Yeah. In my own mind, like I was, I was nothing, but like I had arrived in my own mind. And at this point, this is when I felt the most empty. And I'm just like, really, like. I have everything that the world says you're supposed to have. People want to know my name, money, attention, significance, likes on my Facebook posts back when Facebook was for brand new, right? Like, and I'm standing there and I'm just like, I, I remember I, I just finished speaking at the biggest event we had ever had and I went home that night and I'm just like, this is it? This surely can't be it, Yeah. right? And that was the moment where I accepted an invitation to go to a church from somebody who was in my downline, who was in my team. Was it already pending or did they send it like right yeah, out? Yeah, I'd been invited a million times by people. Like, hey, you should come, you should come. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Like, I don't, I don't do that. So it's like this moment of contemplation, like yeah, sitting there by yourself. They always talk about, you know, getting alone by yourself after yeah. those big things and people are like, yeah, yeah, what's what's It's like, next? how do you feel? Like, I wonder how, you know, athletes they feel after they win the championship. Yeah. Right. They wake up the next morning after partying and like, like it's probably some of the worst. It's probably like one of the worst days. I've heard that before, actually. Really? And so, um, and so that's kind of what it felt like. It was like this just empty feeling. And, uh, and so I, I went to a church and they did the, the altar call thing. Right. And I'm like, my hand went up and I'm like, Oh, what's happening? You know, yeah. you want Jesus in your heart? I'm like, I don't even know what that means, bro. You sound weird. Yeah. You know? And, um, but I was like, why is it weird when I say the name Jesus out loud? It's like, it's weighty. Yeah. I'm like, that's so interesting. It's like people get offended when you say that word. Yeah. And so, and so now we just, we say it like, like in, in vain, right? Like, yeah, like yeah. if you stub your toe, you know, or, yeah. oh my gosh, I can't believe that you say it like that. They, and they always we, say like if a plane's going down as well, like no matter what, like everyone starts like saying Jesus and like praying to Jesus. Yeah. Like it's their last like, oh, no, no, no. I know that this is real at the end of the day. I need to like yeah. say his name now. But yeah, yeah it's, it becomes like a... But isn't it interesting joke. like how the word, the, just the name itself, it's like the Bible says the name above all other names. Yeah. And it's just, it has this like, this weight on your tongue when you say it and this yeah. authority that carries with it. Correct. And so I didn't understand all that. I raised my hand. I go up in the church and... And they like prayed or whatever, and I I left, and I was just like, I have no idea what just happened, but I feel different. Yeah, like something's different, right? And and so I actually ended up going to a different church where I met my now pastor, um, Pastor Steve Smotherman, and I just remember feeling like um, the first church I went to, like the pastor couldn't lead me, and it was probably pride and ego, but it was a smaller church, and then I went to a bigger one. And I just saw him, and that's just where God wanted me. He, I was supposed to be there. That was where I was supposed to plant my roots and grow, yeah. and grow as a believer. And, um, and and everything changed, man. I mean, from from that point, like my perspective and my worldview on everything started to shift. Yeah. Right. Because we talk about like the church talks about everything, talks about politics, 
talks about controversial issues, talks about the supernatural, talks about the promises, talks about you know uh, business and poverty and like has all these conversations. And so my worldview began to shape and truly there's no way that my company would have had the success it would have had and I would have been able to manage it and be mature enough to manage it if I hadn't been basically, like I, I, I had two parallel tracks of growth. It was my spiritual growth and then my business growth. So I, I was reading all the business books and all this stuff as well and getting in those rooms and doing those things, but I was doing the supernatural things as well. I was, I was taking care of, this, of the spiritual as well as the physical, right? You had a moment that I remember where you had said, at one point you got down on your knees, or this is the way that I pictured it, and you were like, God, like you had pretty much lost everything, if I remember right. Yeah. And, and you had talked about the next thing that you wanted to do. Tell me about that and, and also where your relationship dynamic was at that point as well. Yeah. When, when you went to this church, you weren't obviously connected to Kaylin and not yeah. married yet or any of that stuff. So yeah. break that down. So the difference is the, the story I just told, that was when I was saved. That's when I became a, what I would call a believer. Yeah. Like, I believe. Yeah. Right? And the moment on my knees in my bedroom when my, like, basically everything that I had built was hanging on a string, that was when I became a follower. Mm. Right? Mm. And so that moment in my bedroom was like, um, the network marketing company crashed, right? Like, yeah. income, it lost, lost income, team, influence, right? Like, it, it, it crashed on it me. Hurt, That's what bro. happened. It hurt. Yeah. I got kicked out of my town home. We moved into a 400 square foot apartment. So, Same company. So it's like, yeah. I felt the burn, bro. I felt the burn. Right? So what goes up sometimes must come down, you know, yeah. in certain ways. And um, my, wa my fiance at the time, so I had gotten together with Kaylin. She was my fiance at the time. And we didn't have a date set for a wedding. And she was like getting courted by another network marketing company to like join them. And she hadn't answered my phone calls in like four days. And I'm like working at gas stations, fixing windshield chips to like just to eat basically. Yeah. And, um, and so everything was like hanging by a thread. It was like all, I had all that stuff and then I lost it. Funny thing how the world works, right? Like yeah. it'll chew you up and spit you right back out. It just will. Right. And that's the entrepreneurship journey. Like that was the first time I had fully cycled and like had success and then lost it all. Right. Mm. Like that's such a, there's something about like the more times that happens, like your maturity level as an entrepreneur just increases. And like, that's like your, those cycles of, of, of your business growing and then, you know, either crashing or you selling it. That's great if that's the result. But, but ultimately you, you end up cycling and those are the season shifts. Those are so critical. But anyway, so I'm over here hanging by a thread. I got down on my knees in my bedroom and I was just like, God, if you are real and you help, one of those like, I'm going to make a deal kind yeah, of things. Of course. That's what I thought I was doing. Um, but really, I was just, I was really laying it down at his feet and submitting. And I had known, I'd been learning at church and attending and, and doing the whole like, doing that thing. And I was just getting educated. But I, but I didn't really follow. And here's how I didn't know I'd follow. The Bible says that your, your heart follows your treasure, mm -hmm. and I didn't give any money because money was my God. Wow. Because significance and success and money was my God, and so I didn't give any of that to God, mm -hmm. right? Like, I didn't give any money to the church. I didn't give any money to anybody, right? And so I'm on my knees, and that was the thought I had. God was like, you need to give. And I was like, God, I will give, and I will never forget you or forget this is the reason right here if you help me out of this. And so I almost made one of those things where I just wanted to be so certain that God was real that like I knew that if things went well after this, yeah, it had to have been him because they were so bad. And what's amazing about God is that he restores everything and he'll restore anything. Like he, he's, he's a God that restores. And so my, my fiance came back, Caitlin, she came back to, to our house. We restored our, our relationship. By the way, I forgot this part. I'm on my knees. That whole thing happened. I gave like $300 and I had like, 
$500. That's all I had. Yeah. So I gave like more than like half of what I had at the time, right? Mm -hmm. More than half. And it felt like everything, you know what I mean? And, and so I did that and that was like my act of obedience and like just answering that. And I think that's, that's when I became a follower because now my heart followed my treasure and I don't care who you are, like whatever you spend your money on will tell me what your priorities are. And then after that, whatever you spend your time on. And actually entrepreneurs, it's the inverse. So entrepreneurs, it's actually whatever we spend our time on is what actually what we value. Mm. Because, mo because I would say successful entrepreneurs, if you're getting started, your money's probably there, but you'll make the shift where your yeah. time will then become more valuable than your money. And wherever you spend your time is what you actually value, right? And God always wants to be first, right? And so do you spend your time doing things for God that don't benefit you? And are you spending time with your family? Are you spending time? And that's what's so, so that's how God's been working on me is he's like, I, I went through the shift of like, oh, you give money and I've, I've given all the way. And I wrote a rocket ship. Like after that encounter, my wife came back, we spent two months, we created the initial like V1 product of what is what became Lady Boss, mm -hmm. right? And sold $200 million in revenue over the course of, you know, it was like 200K, 2 million, 7 million, 30 million, 33, 40, 44. So like that rocket ship ride mm -hmm. that created that ink number four, like that was God. Cause like I knew the words to say in meetings like I, I, uh, I took massive action. People came in, employees, like things just lined up. Like you wouldn't, it just didn't make sense. Yeah. You know, and like, yes, I worked hard. I worked very you hard. You did. <laughs> God can't do your part. Yeah. But you can't do his either. Yeah. And, and it, it happened so fast. It almost felt like, um, but I never, I never miss. I've always given. Yeah. Like 10% and above everything of my, my increase that whole way. And I wrote some big checks and I was, I'm like, man, this is a hard check to write, but God loves a cheerful giver. And it's like, it's like you wouldn't have any of it, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it's like that, that was a thing. And then it switched. It became oh God. Like God's like, brain, I want your time. Like, because now that's number one, right? Money's more. Like at first it was money and then it's time. And so that switch happens and that's where, that's where you really see what, what people are about. You know, you can see, like if I look at, if you make, if you make a couple hundred grand a year or less, mm -hmm. we can, I can see exactly what you value by looking at your mint account, <laughs> yeah. you know, your mint, like in, you know, QuickBooks, your personal finances. I know exactly what's important to you. Yeah. And if you don't think that that's true, you're fooling yourself. Because I promise you, when you buy that new car and you park it all far away and, and you wash it on the weekend, right? Like it's important to you because you spent money on it, yep. right? You buy a new watch, you know, you're like, you're like, you know, yeah. you're, you're cleaning it. Someone's walking by you and you like put it behind you. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> watch out. Yeah, yeah. You're like, you, you put it in its, its pretty case and you... You, you got it all. It's on display. Yeah. You know, like the things that we invest our dollars in, we vote. We vote with our dollars, right? Yeah. And so, and so, but then it switches. I think if once you, you make over a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, it turns into your time because you realize it's more valuable to you. Mm. And that's when God started pulling on me and was like, Brandon, like, I want your time. Wow. Like, what are you doing for my kingdom? Like, I know you're doing these things that benefit you and I'm blessing what you put your hand to because you give. And because I'm multiplying the money through you and you're a river and you're not a dam, you're not a reservoir, mm -hmm. but what are you doing with your time? And so not only do we sow, sow what we reap, but we sow where we reap, or excuse me, we reap where we sow, Yeah. right? So we not only reap what we sow, but where we sow. And so when we sow time in areas for the kingdom, we reap that time back. Mm -hmm. And that's never been been truer. And, and it's it's wild how like, I'll, I'll be serving and then I'll kind of fall away. And then I watch like feeling my time constraint, like I'm too busy and like stuff keeps coming up and like the team isn't getting it. And like, and then I'll start to press in on time. And like, what am I doing for God's kingdom with my time? 
right? So even when I meet people, I always ask like, cool, so you go to, you're a Christian, you go to church, like where do you serve? Yeah. Like, what do you do, you know, like how do you serve? And, and that's always an interesting one is like, like is God really first? If you're a successful entrepreneur, you may give, that's amazing. Yeah. And, but it's, it's funny because God's just like, he's all or nothing. And we, like, we hate absolutes. The world hates absolutes, but he's all or nothing. Correct. What do you think it's like now stewarding wealth? Right, you have this, you had 500 bucks in the account. God says give. You give like over half of it. Do you ever have these weird feelings sometimes now that you're managing wealth? Like you talked about, you have investments in so many different areas and you have a, a literal like company that helps vet all of your investments. And you ever had these weird moments where you walk in and you're like, will God ever come up to me again and be like, give it all, like give it all away. <laughs> and like, have you ever had those thoughts? Cause every once in a while I have these weird thoughts. Yeah. I go into a grocery store and I'm like, if God told me to like buy everyone's groceries here, what if it was just my thought and I accidentally make a wrong decision and then I end up like giving all my money away like an idiot off of like a random thought, but yeah. then you also want to be obedient, you know? And sometimes when you're pressing in thinking, if God's God <laughs> and all knowing, all powerful, like he can make us do some, or at least put some things in our path that could seem really, really crazy or dumb. Have you ever had any of those thoughts? Because it's different to steward money than it is to rely on grace and miracles. 500 bucks, if you give it all away, you're, you're screwed anyway. Whether you have 500 bucks or not, like you're screwed. You know, what are you gonna do with 500 bucks? Yeah. But when you got tens of millions of dollars invested and you're hearing from God on how to steward it, have you ever had thoughts like, will God ever tell me to give yeah. it all away? <laughs> Yeah, no, I've definitely had that thought. And you read like the story of the rich man and, you know, yeah. the rich young ruler. But, but see, God just wanted to be first. And he knew that he could never be first for yeah. the rich young ruler if he didn't give away what he had. Someone had but see, me, I was... put God first and then it was my increase was given to me. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would say biblically, you got to give 10% of your increase. Yeah. And if you don't do that, you're being robbed of a blessing. You're robbing yourself of a blessing. Yep. And beyond what you could comprehend. And, and then I think anything above that is an offering, right? So anything above that is, you know, out of the generosity, the spirit of your heart. But ultimately, God doesn't need your money. And this is like where I came to the realization too, was like, God doesn't need your money. Like, he, he, he literally, the universe is a handbreadth. Everything that we can see in this earth and can't even fathom how big the universe is because we, we know how big it is yeah. and it keeps growing. It's, it's between here and here, as pinky as thumb, right? So it's like, we think that God needs our money. He doesn't need anything from us, Correct. right? And so, and so when you think about God doesn't need anything from me, but he's, he just wants my heart. That's all he wants. Mm. He desires a relationship and he desires us to choose him, right? People go, well, how could you, how could you believe in like God knows the beginning from the end, but we still have free will, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that like a contradiction? But the, re the reality is, is he's God, right? It's a mystery. It's like, but you still have free will because if we didn't have free will, then we wouldn't, if he just said, I'm gonna make my creation and then just force them to love me, then yeah. it's not love yeah. because love isn't forced. Yeah. It's, a ch it's a decision, it's a choice, right? And so I think God just wants us to choose him first and money inside of that equation is just a part of it, right? It's like, I, I want your obedience. Like, here's a promise. Give, give me 10%, give me 10% uh, of your increase, right? That's, that's I forgot the, the, the Greek word or whatever that, that's for, but it's the word is increase, like your increase, right? Yep. It's not 10% of any specific number besides your increase. And, and then anything above that, I mean, he says, according to the measure you give, the measure it will be given back to you. So yeah. it's a faith thing at that point, right? What, what do you feel? And even on the finance side, God, God knew finances was going to be a big deal, especially for man. Yeah. Like that's our like, it's, it's the power tool, right? It's the blank check. If you have a money, yeah. you can buy anything. You have a car, you have to trade it to someone who has a car. Yeah. Usually for money. And if you had to trade it for something, they'd have to have your watch yep. <laughs> to buy the car. And, and so they, he knew. But it's all cattle and like yeah. goats in the yeah, Bible, let's trade right? This and when you read like cattle and goats, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's like yeah. He had ten thousand. That's like Ferraris and 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 houses and yeah. Now real estate. But he, yeah. that was the only thing he said. Test me in this. Right? Yeah, it's like because he just knew and he said it pressed down, shaking together and running over. And it's just like a, it's a cool 
promise. You had talked about even like, so if I heard an audible voice yep. and God was like, you need to give all of your money away, yeah, I would probably do it. <laughs> I like how he says probably. I said probably. I'd have to fact check it with my, with the Bible, my pastor, yeah, dude. some sp- insight in my... But I've never heard an audible voice. Yeah. Right? Like God gives me thoughts. He puts people in my life. He confirms things in multiple and, ways. And I think the confirmation part's big, right? Yeah. God will always confirm what he's speaking and it'll yeah. be tested against his word great other leaders like there would be there's a and, and his path is in peace as well yes and his and his grace is what provides the capability and power to carry out the thing so it won't feel like right now if you have no grace for it it's going to feel like that would be kind of crazy this i've given all this away but if it actually was god the grace would be there as well where what that the power to do it would be there yeah so it wouldn't it wouldn't be any different than your obedience to follow what he's doing with the 10 percent it's just that grace is there for right. that. So I think that that's it. it's where the grace is. And that's right. The yeah. amount is, is irrelevant to him. Correct. Like it's your heart. Yeah. And the amount is just a reflection of, of your heart. It's a formula. It's like like when uh, when the woman gave a penny at the well and, and Jesus said, way you, bigger, yeah. And yeah, was Jesus like, you gave the most because yep. it was in proportion. Yeah. So the amount never mattered. He doesn't need our money, but he just wants our heart. Yeah. And he knows that our heart will follow our treasure. And so he's like, okay, give your money because then I'll have your heart and then you can reap all of these blessings that I have for you. But it yeah. takes our faith and, to do and that. think of how that principle works so much. I remember when I joined Russell's inner circle with you guys, it was because I saw people marketing online and I knew I need to put the money there. Like I need to do something to sow into that area of my life because when I put my money there, like my heart's going to go that way. I'm going to actually sit there. I'm going to learn. So it's even deeper, right? It's like the, the principle works like gravity. Like you're just like, it works no matter what. And I think that knowing that wherever you sow, if you sow into a, a, we helped kids sponsor kids to after school programs, I started caring about kids more because my money was going there. Yeah. And you you had sown into sex trafficking, like meaning freeing girls from sex trafficking. Yeah. And and when you probably sowed into that, there was more connection than there was before. Yeah. And, and if you sow time as an entrepreneur, that's totally different because you're like up here. I, I have a quick question around this though. At 10%, we have the Bible, right? The Word of God. There's two different words of God. There's the spoken Word of God where He may speak to you or you have an encounter or you've seen you know, your wife get healed of, of an ailment. Those are like, whoa, God's doing it right now. Have His written Word where He's already written it and it's always speaking. We hear tithing and we hear giving and, and obedience. When I look at Saul, we had talked about this right before, that, uh, that obedience is better than sacrifice. So good. Saul decided when God spoke to the prophet... Samuel spoke to Saul, said, go basically kill all these animals, all these people. And it was really gnarly, but it was all obedience. He didn't. He kept some of the best like calves. He spared the king, did all these extra things and came back and was like, I'm going to, oh, I was going to obey. That was like the spoken word of God. And that kind of freaks me out a little bit because you have tithing, you have, you have offerings, you have things that go above and beyond. For you, how does God speak to you in that that fresh way, how do you recognize it to be obedient? Uh, I, I was at a grocery store the other day. I walked by a guy is in the baby aisle in accident. And I really felt like God said, like, buy the baby food. And I walked past him. I tried to keep walking away and I really felt to get stronger. And I have other times where I'm like, am I missing this sometimes? And so like I bought, it was like 20 bucks of baby food. It wasn't like a great grand old thing. I didn't buy a, a widow a car or something. But it, it was just like, I was just trying to be obedient. But that's not, it doesn't say in scripture, buy guy baby food in aisle three. Mm -hmm. So how does God speak to you in that rhema fresh voice? How do you recognize it? And what are some examples of you being obedient in that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's so good. I mean, I think that's every every believer is constantly trying to get in tune with that voice, right? And so Jesus left, he sends the Holy Spirit, right? And so the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us and is our comforter, our guide, our counselor. And so that would be the voice that we'd be recognizing, right? That would be the leaning. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I don't know if there's like, there's not like one answer of like, how do I know God's telling me to do something? Yeah. That's basically what you're asking. And I'm like- What have you experienced? Like what's been the, what you've seen before? Yeah, I I think, I think I get convictions 
it's like deep in my belly, like I need to do something. I get ideas and I start to write and develop them. Mm. And then sometimes they grow legs and then sometimes they don't. You know what I mean? And I think I pray and I pray audibly out loud. Yeah, you were talking about that. It's like so, it's such a big thing for me right now. Just um, the power of like, we need to get out of our own head. And like, I had this thing like, oh, I know God can hear my thoughts because he's omniscient, all right? He's omnipresent, he's omniscient, he's everywhere. Yeah. But there's something that happens and, and we know death and life are in the power of the tongue that when we speak. And so I've been inten- intentionally praying out loud even when I'm by myself and reading the Bible out loud. And there's actually like research that shows the power of reading something out loud for our brain and how we recognize it. Um, just just in our brain, something different happens, you know, and I'm not an Andrew Humerman, I can't explain it all, right? <laughs> like, I'm like, give me the principle and I'll just do it, right? Yeah. And and so something different happens when we read out loud. And so, um, so I pray out loud, I just ask, like, Holy Spirit, is this what I'm supposed to do? Is this a direction? And sometimes it's like, I just get a leaning one way or the other. Yeah. I, I don't. I, I don't know how to call it anything but a leaning because you'll get thoughts, you'll get confirmations. You know, you you you, you test and check things by people that you you know um, have your best interests, right? Mentors, friends. Um, you know, I talk to my wife all the time, and. I know that God has given me the ability to sort things out through talking them out. Mm. That's, I, I think, out loud. Yeah. And so literally, like, I'll be like, honey, I just I need to just digest something and I'll just like spew it all out just so we can like process through it. Um, but it's weird. Like, I think the thing that's hard is like, how much time do you give something? But I think one thing that's interesting is um, I, I, I don't think... I don't think there's um, this giant like right or wrong th- direction all the time, right? Like we are so obsessed with like not making the wrong, like as human beings, we're, we're very obsessed with not making wrong decisions mm-hmm. that we just do nothing and we make no decisions. And so I literally have a business practice where I'm like, okay, Brandon, make three decisions that you've been putting off And I'll be like, all right, God, give me the wisdom to make these three decisions. Decision number one, I'm leaning in this direction. Let's go. Decision made. Right. And it's like, God can't steer a parked car. Yeah. And we need to stop being afraid. And, 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 And so the Bible says we don't have a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Yeah. And so like, if you're sitting in indecision and you don't have a sound mind, which I promise you, if you're sitting in indecision, you do not have a sound mind. Correct. Just make a decision in power and then start moving in that direction. And if it's not the right decision, it will reveal itself. And so it's yeah. like, we're waiting for so much confirmation and so much like, like, like God's going to like blow up a pinata in front of us every time we like, you know, is this what I should do today? Should I work with this person? Should I hire this person? It's like, yes, we pray for wisdom, but like God's going to make it all work out for good, but like we need to take steps and, and move. Yeah, it, right? re- it reminds me of your verse that you had talked about. Even when you're building Lady Boss, you said that you put Jesus in your bio and people recognized it now. Someone had said something to you, oh, always liked that you had God in your bio. And you're like, oh, that's so funny. I remember when I did that because he says, acknowledge me in all your ways and I'll make your path straight. And your version that you love is that crown your efforts with with success. And it reminds you of that. And this really spoke to me on a business side because on a spiritual side, I feel like I had flexed that. So like I used to practice words of knowledge where God says it, the Holy Spirit, there's gifts of words of knowledge. And and this is what, what Jesus used when he spoke to the guy and said, I saw you underneath the fig tree, right? It's like no one, he was alone. And that's why it was like, oh, you're Jesus. Like, this is legit. <laughs> that's what I would have thought at least. And and I would go to stores and I'd be like, God, you better speak to me because I'm going to look really dumb if I go try to represent you and you don't give me something for someone. And I just recognize how many times I leave these like open loops that crush me, right? You you're, you have a show called Big Business Mistakes and like, like a lot of my big mistakes or the things that haunt me are the dumbest little things that I leave like undecided. You know, like I have so many of those open things right now that clog my mind. And so that spoke to me just because I'm like, 
What if I was just like, hey, God, I'm going to make decisions on these things. And I'm acknowledging you in all my ways. I'm asking you for wisdom and help on this. I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to make my best decision on these things and just making it. It just seems like very simple, but man, it's weird. It's easy to get clogged up in, in all that stuff or forget. Like that's where I'm at. And I'm yeah. like, oh wow, that's good. Yeah. I think, I think the enemy thrives in indecision. Certainly. I think that people are robbed of dreams, desires, hopes, success, anything, because they're just unwilling to make a decision. There's like, and, and literally no decision is a decision. Yeah. Right. And you're just stuck at a standstill. And, and here's the, here's the thing. This is like, and you know, after, after selling lady boss and moving into the next phase of what we're doing, trust me, if there's a topic of like, I need to hear from God, it's like, what am I going to do with the next decade of my life? Yeah. Because now I have resources, options, experience a network i know what i'm capable of right and before it was just like this just was the next logical step yeah now it's like an abundance of options and i was like man i've been leaning into like god what do you want me to do and i've asked this question to so many people and it's like one of the best answers that i got um, from my pastor and he was like brandon he's like the bible says that it's impossible to please god without faith right Mm -hmm. and so how would you please God or how would you be able to operate without faith? Well, the answer would be so clear you wouldn't even need faith, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like, well, if he just came down with a thundering voice and was like, this is your next business idea. This is the next person you should hire. Does that take any faith? No. No, it doesn't because you know it's him, right? Or at least that's how I would view it. Yeah. You know, people watch Jesus raise people from the dead and still didn't believe when they were standing there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, okay, but that's a different thing. But my point is, is that it's impossible to please him without faith. And so we just have to understand that it's going to take faith in our decision making, especially to know where to go, because that's how we please God. Wow. And so we're like, all right, God, I don't have all the answers. It's not perfectly clear to me, but I'm going to just act in faith and take a step forward in faith and make a decision. And then I'm going to have to figure it out. And guess who I'm going to come to and I don't need help? Yeah. Him. And then he's like, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with that. Yeah. Because it took faith. So good, dude. And I know that even our relationship, what we're doing with Kings, he's representing the King shirt right now. I'm repping, With King's man. Brotherhood. I'm like, I'm repping. I'm feeling like the loser is not repping. I'm like, what am I? I don't even have my dog tag on. Yeah. I don't know I, what you're doing. I'm repping God's business though <laughs> as well. I'm like, you're repping Kings. I'm repping God's business where, which was a, a Bible study that you throw together, that turned into an entrepreneur group that we've done in Austin. And, and I've been a part of, it's been so cool. I've, I've preached at it even, and you put it on hold and I was like, is it because my preaching was bad? I don't know if you saw my response. I was like, is my preaching bad? No, no. <laughs> but it, it's been so fun. And and really, like, our world's intertwined with you guys exiting Lady Boss, you now investing, taking equity, and mentoring these these businesses that are going from 1 to 50 million and, and that want to ride the rocket ship. And, and ultimately, even if they don't ride the rocket ship, how about just not go through the same failures and do all the same stuff that you went through? And so in that process, like I had run men's events for six years. I was looking to incorporate this ministry side that I'm like, I love, but it was just so like stuck in my head. Uh, this is impossible to do. And I didn't have a lot of good examples of people doing it well either. Like this is a very fresh thing. Uh, and so it was just really cool for us to come together as two guys going, how do we get other men together that are Christians and want to pursue this area of their life and get around that sharpening? but on the same side are actually actively feeling like their ministry is inside a business and that's the niche. Yeah. Right. And so like, what, what was that process like you, what made you want to be a part of that? Cause it, it feels like that was a divine thing for you. For me, it ends up, it's a weird thing. Like your perspective of mine, we probably do documentary because it's so much mental craziness in my head. I don't even <laughs> remember how it happened. I'm like, I don't even know, bro. I was like, it just yeah, happened and kind of here we are. And, I'm getting messages every day of people like, I see you stepping in your calling, please don't stop. Like all these messages of of cool confirmation and and our clients as well, the guys in King's Brotherhood, I get messages every week. Some of them every week on the dot, every week they're like, thank you so much. Please keep doing this. Dude, I got some great messages this morning from the guys after that call yesterday. Yeah. 
Such a great call, man. Yeah. So, so much fun. So, so what made you like want to get involved with all of that? Yeah. Um, I think after, after that, that my first big company, right. It was almost like my value shifted and not like, not like, Oh, I value, I you know, integrity or the kingdom or family, not like that, but like the value of how I wanted to spend my time and work shifted, mm. right? It was like before it was in health and it was just like grow as fast as you can yeah. and make it successful and do everything. And we did everything, right? And so it's almost like, it's almost like I experienced this value shifting where I'm like, I really want the work that I do now to be with people that I really align with fully, not just like as entrepreneurs, but um, as believers as well. Yeah. And so when I have an opportunity, and then all of a sudden I started being open. See, I, I, I had this thing called blinders on, which yeah, is, needed. is absolutely needed for every entrepreneur that I work with and everyone in general. They're trying to do too many things at once. They're, yeah. they're evaluating and open to all these opportunities instead of just focusing on what they're doing. And, um, and this manifests itself inside the business where they're like, should just be focusing on one product or one product line or one acquisition method and they're trying to complicate everything. And sometimes it manifests itself in like trying to do, you know, oh, I got my main business and then I'm gonna have Airbnb business over here. Yeah. And then I'm gonna be a watch trader over here, yeah. right? Like, no, 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 like we need to focus. But stepping into this new season, my value started to shift and it started to become, I really want to align myself with entrepreneurs that I really, believe in them and then their heart and then and the fruit of what they're doing beyond just like it's financial fruit yeah. but but the kingdom impact of it right and so when you're at a point where money now is just like this tool and you're not ever worried about it again it's like well what's the motivation behind my career it's like what's really driving it and so i want to do something that has kingdom impact and so I'm looking at opportunities, I'm open. Yeah. And then I see someone like you who had all the success helping men, but you have this whole spiritual side that like nobody knows about. And really to me was the strongest thing that you had to offer. Yeah. And so, but there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's not that many models of financial and like business combined with ministry. Yeah. Right. Like it's kind of either you're a church or you're secular. Right. Correct. And but now with, you know, the community that that you've built and, and now that's that's shifting. Right. Yeah. And it needs to be because the marketplace is, is a way f and a vehicle to reach people. And so it's like we talked about I had these two parallel growth paths. Right. Yeah. It was like I had the business growth path and the business groups and the, and the business people. And then I had like my church spiritual growth path in my church. Now it's like you're combining those two things into one group, into yeah. one community, into one place where they can access it. Like that got me excited. And I, and I was like, if you like this vision, then I'd love to help. Yeah. Right. And that was like basically a conversation. Like God gave me a word after church one day. And I was like, really? And I, so I called you and that's when we had that conversation. Yeah. And I just, I planted a seed and just wanted to see what would happen. Yeah. And lo and behold, it's like, absolutely flourished yeah right and and is sprouting and people are messaging you the guys are getting immense value like that's what's so cool now you got a podcast called god's business yeah it's like just answering that call and being obedient to it uh, but not being afraid of like oh what do people think or oh we're, we're charging for this group and it's you know it's like <laughs> god is not a socialist yeah. you know what i mean like Going back to the principle, it's like we value and we our heart follows where we put our treasure. Yeah. Right. And so we just have money wrong. Like we just look at it wrong. Yeah. Especially as a business owner, you look at outside of business owner, sure. But as a business owner, we're like money's the currency that we do stuff with. You know, it's like it's yeah. the oxygen of a business. It's like oh, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna throw some of my effort and my resources into that. And and like you had talked about. It's interesting now, I had a lot of Christian guys because of my story, because of my wife, because of how we met. It's very difficult not to with, with who we are. 
So when we switched to King's Brotherhood and started talking about the things of God, 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power, is like the overarching theme. Because I was like, I'm not going to do this if it's junk. Yeah. It, it was like um, what I had seen was that the guys were like, this is, this is what I always wanted. And it's been so fun, man. I'm excited to, to grow it together. And it was so cool. Yeah, yesterday you were literally pouring into the guys' business scaling secrets. And, and also, you know, wrapping up, I love... You had talked about your big business mistakes. You guys had just launched a show. This is you and Kaylin together. You guys are doing in-person interviews. You guys are doing in-person, just you guys teaching, training, sharing your stories. More like me getting heckled by Kaylin, yeah. Is it? I haven't, I, I haven't been able to, you guys have released a few episodes so far. I haven't been able to see them. I, I was like, I know you guys are amazing, uh, but I cannot wait to hear We're trying to make this. it fun. This is know? the hook then. If you want to watch Brandon get heckled by Kaylin, <laughs> With her probably sparkly outfit on, uh, a ring that can knock someone out. <laughs> it's like, if you want to see that, go watch Big Business Mistakes. Oh, yeah. It's, She's fun, man. My wife is, like, so eccentric, right? But I'd be yeah. such a such a stiff without her, you know? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> like, I'd be such a bored, yeah. you know, because I'm just like... I'm just like driven. I'm just like, what's next to get done, you know? Yeah. But she's like the life of the party, man. I, she was speaking at an event the other weekend, and it was like an M and A event. <laughs> and she's like, I'm gonna get on stage, and I'm gonna tell my my opening joke. I'm gonna tell everybody that I'm the halftime show. <laughs> <laughs> she's done like this, like fluorescent, like pink and orange and like glittery sequin, like dress thing going on. And she's talking about um, she's talking about building a personal brand, and and she's at this M and A event, right? And yeah. everybody loved it. She was like, they laughed so hard. Everybody loved it. I was like, I was like, you're just she's the life of the party, man. So it's been a lot of fun to just to like connect with her and do the show together with yeah. my wife, you know? Because we're always it's always been the two of us building, yep. like building the business together, and we're really yin and yang in that way. And, you know, I'm the builder and the driver and, you know, I hire and I develop the organization and I handle the money and I handle the team and, um, and, and we make the strategic, you know, marketing and sales decisions together. But she's the guru when it comes to social media and, and selling and, and just that part of it. So it's been a lot of fun to like talk and just like have these conversations and record and, yeah. and talk about the mistakes you know, because everybody wants to talk about all the tips. Nobody wants to talk about the mistakes. Nobody wants to know all the crap we did wrong. But reality is like, while everybody's sitting on these shows in these stu podcast studios talking about, all, oh, here's all the amazing tips and do this and do this and do this. And I had this exit and I had this. It's like, dude, you have no idea how many gut, how many freaking sweaty Mike Tyson looking guys just ran into my office and gut punched me every single day. Yeah. And these are all the mistakes, right? And, uh, and then you learn from the lesson from the mistake, obviously. Yeah. But it's been a lot of fun to, to, to talk about that stuff. Humbling as well. 100%. And I've been able to see some of those throughout the years, and it's been fun to watch. I always talked about if I ever had a bad day, I just need to go listen to now big business mistakes. But at the time, just ask Brandon, how, how was your week? How was your month, man? It's like, oh, well, this person stole my identity here, and this person sent a dick pic here, and, and this, <laughs> uh, this this product got blown up in a truck and like blew up and white powder spreading across the road. That's exactly and, what happened. And so, yeah. uh, obviously... It's Man, that's good right there. You got dick pics, trucks blowing up. Oh, I got more too, bro. I got it yeah. like pretty hammered down. Yeah. So, uh, those are those are some good that's hooks. The next, that's the next episode title there. Next episode. <laughs> yeah, Real Brandon Poolin. That's that's Instagram. Yeah. Instagram.com slash Real Brandon Poolin. You guys have big business mistakes. You have Enterprise CEO, which is this is the place where these are the people that are, if you're over a million dollars a year, and you're looking for the place to, to grow and scale, like this is this is what I'm a part of with King's Brotherhood, just in a deeper dynamic of, of friendship. But this is what you guys are doing now is this place to to really grab hold of the entrepreneur and like chuck him into the future. You're like, all right, little guy, like whew, we're gonna check you into the future and give you the, the roadmap and game yeah. plans. This stuff I'm seeing is crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Like I worked on my own company for 10 years and then now I'm in these other companies. Yep. And it's so clear to me, and I'm just like, they're like, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, we just saved so much pain. Yep. I'm like, there's $200,000, there's a million dollars. It's like, it's fun, I love it, it's yeah. so much fun. 
like just being able to serve in that way has been really cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on God's Business where we're incorporating Jesus and business together. I use Jesus because you talked about the weightiness of his name. And if you guys have watched all the way to the end of this episode, you're going to want to leave a five-star review as well as uh, subscribe on iTunes. If you aren't watching the, the video version, head over to YouTube. Make sure to subscribe as well as there's a little notification bell. This allows you to know when we drop new episodes, when we bring in people like Brandon. If you have not yet, go check out Big Business Mistakes. We're talking about the same platforms here. So type it in, go over there, give them some love as well, and check out those episodes of them crashing and burning. And thanks again, man. Yeah, I love you, man. This has been so yeah. awesome. So glad to be on this. I'm pumped you're doing this show. Like this is gonna be, I can't wait to see this evolve. Like people aren't gonna wanna miss it. Number ones, man. Number one, top in the Don't charts. Miss it.